to the generalist, where security practitioners come to look beyond niches, silos, egos, and hopefully build their credibility and competence. My name is Ilya Umansky. So, as was discussed on the teaser, we are going to talk about our obsession with cyber security. Um, this is probably going to be a little bit of a rant and a little bit of um, uh, just reflection on what is going on and how do we get to where we are today. Um, it's no secret that we're all seeing so many different incidents. Some uh, recently, uh, a lot of ransomware uh, that is being discussed by uh, the, the highest levels of the at least U.S. government and various other um, country governments, talking about how a single piece of ransomware could affect um, entire, let's say, health uh, systems uh, or health institutions, and how it's being prolif prolific in affecting banking institutions and so on and so forth. Um, we're also noticing how um, there is unfortunately um, still no um, agreement and probably never will be agreement about um, kind of how to move on. Um, what do we do with cloud? What do we do with um, the legacy systems and on-premises? How, how do we align with what uh, people describe as digital transformation? Um, and the bigger question I feel for us is to not look ahead. Yes, I said that. Not to look ahead. But to really ask a question, where are we now? How do we get here? Okay, and what preceded our current state of affairs? And our current state of affairs, unfortunately, is not wonderful. And I'll get, in, get into it. Um, so much the same ways I've been talking about kind of the industry as, as, as a whole. Um, and then I talked about a little bit um, what is happening on the, in the camp that's, that's continually described as physical security. Um, cybersecurity is no different in my, in my humble estimation, with the exception of um, availability and diversity of talent. So we'll get into that as well. So how did we get to the current state of affairs? And the current state of affairs is, um, if you look at um, sources like Information is Beautiful or various other reports from Verizon, from Gartner, and, and what have you, it is easy to see that while we have been saying as an industry that there's so many things we need to fix, so many opportunities for us to improve, um, we are seeing uh, so many different incidents successful incidents, unfortunately, um, um, affecting organizations of different sizes. And those incidents are scaling up and they're also increasing in volume. So what got us to this point? We, you know, there seems to be a lot of drive in the industry to do better, right? Um, but I also feel like there's a little bit of preaching to the choir going on. Um, so, let's not forget that we, on the security side and on the IT side, created the opportunity and threat landscape. We created it. Okay? How do we do that? Well, for one, uh, internet was created, right? And the internet was created with such naivete uh, about um, how humans behave and how humans uh, interact with one another, how they interact with technology, uh, that we can now see that, system, that, that platforms like Facebook and, uh, and um, uh, Google and uh, Snapchat and Instagram occupy our brains. And they occupy them sometimes with positive outcomes, but very often with very negative outcomes. So the next thing 
that I see uh, is uh, really the product of the internet is this volumization of data, okay? We have crazy amounts of data now stored in either cloud uh, data centers such as Google, Facebook, and whoever else um, uh, hosts the, that data. And they're also created, that, that, that data is also created within organizations. Um, we don't know for sure whether this data is all accurate. How, you know, this data doesn't come from thin air. It's, uh, much of it is data entry, uh, an input point by a human, right? Uh, some of this data is created by computing systems. Uh, but again, um, I'll get into the point about where computing systems came from. And so we have a ton of data that, um, despite various regulations, GDPR and, and others, um, is so global, is so overshared, and so uh, poorly understood, particularly at the level of an organization, that when we talk about how do we conduct digital transformation, for example, we don't even answer a question, right? How do we classify data as an asset? Do we even treat it as an asset? Do we understand um, what data um, costs the, the organization in terms of um, operational loss, reputational loss, and uh, also in terms of the monetary loss? Uh, and, unfortunately, data is beholden to the old-style policies that uh, organizations continue to write. So, for example, you know, the same thing about data classification, right? What do you think is guiding uh, governance of data? It's all a policy that's a, that a human wrote up, probably based on um, some legacy documentation um, that probably says we will classify data and here is the matrix that uh, helps us define the classification tier. Okay, well people forget that data input happens at such a small, such a minute, um, uh, trivial point that unfortunately there is no um, thought processes that are built in at an individual user level that can help classify every point that then contributes to the database. Now, for example, if somebody creates a, uh, a Word document, right, that in a sense uh, is also part now of the digital stream. Uh, and if that person didn't um, or have tools or didn't even think about what that Word document means to the organization in terms of the value of that information. Well, um, how do we uh, then take a look at the larger data set, right, uh, that let's say is, contains terabytes of, uh, of information, and then evaluate it uh, for its criti criticality, right? So I feel like we are talking about, in big words, about data, uh, digital transformation, and all the sorts of tech and analytics that need to exist around data. But we're not talking about the fact that we don't know to very clearly how accurate that data is. We don't know how that data could be further polluted. We don't know how we're protecting that data as an asset because every organization kind of classifies it in their own way. And unfortunately, those classifications don't really um, stand up to the test of um, the scale at which data is being created. There's still, like I said, policy documents um, and uh, something that uh, probably rests on somebody's shelf. So we also created um, democracy of access. As internet started uh, kind of becoming uh, more and more a household name, um, people started believing that, wow, this is such a fantastic tool. I mean, look at Google, for example, right? You can do a search and it circumvents 
pretty much an entire bookshelf if you if you had to look for answers to your questions right um, and you would have spent probably let's say a year reading those books and getting that information and if you're lucky remembering that information whereas Google can produce a result momentarily so think about the power of that and uh, of course we as humans we looked at that we reacted to it I was a student at John Jay College of, you know first thing I first time I saw Google was my statistics class and our professor was just completely enamored with it he was so happy that a tool like this showed up only um, then we started seeing how the internet started pivoting from being this useful tool into um, more of a uh, socially uh, aligned uh, domain where people now um, are happy to tweet things they just superficially overheard and don't understand really the background story about, where um, negative uh, information is being promoted because of algorithms. You just look at the social dilemma on Netflix. And so the access got democratized and we're happy that we're all kind of uh, enjoying drinking the Kool-Aid. But that also creates the attitude to democracy of access when you're in a corporate setting. So you're looking um, kind of at a mindset among general populace, not the security professional, security practitioner populace, but the general populace that actually feels that tech in general uh, is uh, still good, that you can uh, use it as a tool, and there's not much thinking going on about its risks and about how complex it is. Again, I keep on referring to the work of Charles Perrault um, and his book, Normal Accidents. I think that um, you'll do yourself a favor um, and as part of your continuing learning uh, will probably um, benefit quite a bit from reading this text or at least listening to some of his talks and talks by others referring to his work. And so we now are dealing with this vast domain of the internet. We're dealing with vast and vast uh, fields of what's called, what do people call them? Data lakes, right? Uh, so we call, we have these huge volumes of data um, that are dependent on very poor scrutiny, very poor um, measures of classification and protection. Um, and all of this is scaling up. So why do you think um, those who um, believe they need to get their peace how, by whatever means, right? Uh, and people who, let's say, are looking for profits, people who are looking uh, to abuse the system, why do you think this is uh, uh, difficult for them to decide that, that, that this is the medium where they can make a lot of money uh, through illegal means and by abusing humans and systems? Of course, for them, that presents tremendous value. So, please also remember that a lot of folks in cybersecurity, um, where did they come from in the like sort of earlier days? They're all folks that either have computer science degrees, not security degrees. No computer science degree uh, has had tremendous volume of education on ethics of coding, for example, or on um, how to manage a data asset, right, and how to protect it. Uh, only in later years we have seen um, some additional courses, programs started start to stand, uh, to, to be developed, uh, albeit without much uniformity. Um, and so we're seeing that uh, the same folks that stood at the be you know in the early days uh, and, and operated in the early days of the internet of the, of, of data uh, of the scaled up data are now. Um, moving into or have moved into cybersecurity roles, okay? Uh, people who have tinkered with computers. It's all great, but the question is, um, did they really fully understand how dangerous and how, um, uh, what scale um, this, this technology would bring? Uh, so here we are, and incidents are increasing, as I said. We have data 
that is also increasing, its value is increasing, um, and uh, now the internet stopped being just a tool for us. It's no longer just a tool. Uh, yeah, a lot of positive stuff comes from it, a lot of um, positive connections come from it, but we also are seeing an increase in how our psyche is, is being abused, systems are being abused, and they are ever more complex and therefore much more difficult, if not impossible, to protect. So let's also not forget, as I said, that data protection is still a trade. No uniform academic base, no clear career roadmap, otherwise you wouldn't have had such shortage of talent, uh, no licensing, right? So anyone who claims to know networking and some general products and uh, talks um, about threat hunting can probably get into the industry. Um, but again, that person or that group of people likely doesn't understand the questions of deter, detect, detect, delay. They don't understand asset management and asset classification and asset prioritization relative to criticality and uh, severity of loss. Probably don't and haven't studied risk management in general um, for a long time. And so we also see, again, uh, this influx of one-time certifications. I see some names with so many abbreviations after them that it becomes interesting to ask this, the, these folks, like, did you spend more time studying for these things, getting those certifications, than actually doing some good? Okay, let me, again, repeat that. A certification, as I said before, is a one-time stamp based on focused ability to have consumed some uh, arbitrarily created um, volume of information and hopefully having passed a one-time exam. To what degree the competence and credibility of such a person gets scrutinized throughout their professional career? I will leave that question with you because this is what you should be applying to how you interact within the industry and how you apply um, kind of more and more learning to yourself. So we are dealing still with such a scale of the internet, the data, um, complexity, um, tremendous um, gap between where the internet and data specifically have gone and what volume uh, exists um, and legacy policies inability to um, pay attention to um, simple measures uh, which is what a lot of publications uh, have been coming out with and saying you know really a lot of incidents are due to just stupid things like they're very very simple so, um, my take on this is that it's not about tech. It's not about tech. Uh, let's take a look at the people behind both the product side, the people behind who build data systems and systems for just managing and, and communicating data in digital space right, um, who build websites, who build software, um, who code, what kind of decision making are they, are they producing, right? Is that decision making really, inf it's infused with ethics and the ability to think about risk? I don't think so. I really don't. I mean, there are people who are like, look at look at how many apps are coming in every single day with the release of a new phone, right? Look at how many pieces of new software, how many startups in tech space are coming up. FinTech alone 
is responsible for such a volume of new software um, and, and products, right, that um, one could just kind of scratch their head. I mean, if you look at um, these uh, maps of what the fintech space looks like, right, don't you feel like it's, it's, it's kind of, people are like zooming the map out further and further so that it's more and more difficult to read just the names of the organizations that occupy certain sectors in fintech. I mean, and all of them, all of them are creating some form of digital product, okay? Um, how much thought do you think is going into creation of, the, of those products? in just two, from two perspectives, like I said, ethics and risk. And my concern is that there isn't much of that happening. And so the scale is increasing. The um, production uh, volume of uh, systems, platforms, technology is increasing more and more. Uh, the thought processes of in designers and engineers who are responsible for putting out that product, I don't know if it's necessarily changing for the better in terms of thinking about protection and risk. And um, we're still kind of in this strange space as practitioners discussing, oh, you know, how do we, um, how do we uh, protect better uh, why is this product so terrible you know we don't trust any firewalls or we uh, we think that CM has long outlived itself it wasn't a, a useful tool um, what we're not thinking about is that a firewall CM SOAR or anything else out there on the market has been and will continue to be created for the large part by a human being. So let's think about that human being for a second, okay? To what extent does this human being have the capacity to think about risk as they're typing in lines of code? Just think about that for a second, okay? These are our own products in our own industry, okay? To what extent does this person or this group of people think about user experience so that it would be easier and more understandable to use those products, okay? Have you heard the word misconfigured? How many, how often have you heard that word? I'm just throwing it out there, right? So for you to think about, misconfigured, okay? We see time and time again that piece of software got misconfigured, there's something wrong in, either in the lines of code or in the uh, user interface configurations for a, a, a software platform, and oh my God, we lost data. We had a breach or we, we let an, a, a threat actor in. Or uh, we didn't realize it, but we allowed uh, some, some data to leak into the public domain. This, this you know, as they, somehow we start calling uh, data storage parts buckets uh, in data centers. So a da data buckets now um, are internet facing, by you know it could be found uh, through normal public search. Um, how 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 thoughtful is that? So we are not thinking about psychology of individuals on both sides. The psychology of a normal software user, the psychology of the creator of that platform, um, how they think, how would they be able to infuse risk into the product, right? Or risk management, sorry, risk management to the product. Risk they infuse quite, quite, quite a lot of, and we then have to deal with it. Um, how do we um, argue or put, put up um, uh, a defense against crappy stuff that's being designed left, left and right and produced to organizations as practitioners in the industry, right? Where, where is the foundation for us to, to do that, right? At RSA conference, right? Really? We go around and uh, this is a nice, uh, I guess, nice venue to go and take a look at some products, meet some friends for whiskey or for, uh, for whatever other um, uh, enjoyable things that uh, we prefer. 
uh, really build some good relationships, which is great. I don't mind good relationships, it's so fine. But at the end of the day, are we really challenging those who continue to expand the scale of technology with the issue of risk management and asset management? And are we also really able to challenge the organizations that blindly, or for the most part blindly, or without sufficient scrutiny, let's say, adopt more and more tech? No wonder that we have an increase in incidents. I'm not surprised in the least bit why that's happening. You just we're just missing the fundamental issue. Fundamental issue is I don't I have no trust whatsoever in the ability of a coder to think as a risk manager. I have no trust in the ability of a coder to think as a risk manager. I have no trust in the ability of a designer that, that designs software or user interfaces, user experience to think um, as a risk manager. They have no ability to do that. Okay? And I also don't trust the users to think as risk, as risk managers because uh, the user is looking for an easy way to get their work done. Right? They don't necessarily need to think about uh, or, or, or are capable of thinking besides the rest of the responsibilities that they have about risk. Right? And we're not making it simple uh, either because what we're doing is we're constantly increasing the number of abbreviations that are, we're throwing around in the industry. Right? From, from just CM, let's say five to seven years ago, we're now at SOAR. I don't care. It doesn't matter whether we use one abbreviation versus another. Okay? It is still unproven in real operations to, to, to help manage asset protection. Okay? And before we even get there, do we still have a policy that's sitting on the, on the shelf about data protection, data management, or some standards that the organization has developed? To what degree are those standards being implemented across the organization? Are they being implemented uniformly? Are people complying with those standards? Or do we see that the standard exists, but there are constant workarounds? What do those workarounds mean, and who is in charge of creating those workarounds? Are we really helping the organization through those standards, or are we creating an opportunity to bypass? So we're not focusing on human decision-making. We're also not, not focusing on design. Like I said, a uh, big issue is um, simply the next generation of um, computer programs that help, quote unquote, uh, run protection only to sit in front of that monitor and realize how complicated the software is and what type of um, visibility of assets would I have. I was having a conversation with a person who ran a, uh, a fairly large cybersecurity operation uh, for a large organization and uh, we were in the middle of that conversation. I was asking some questions and so on and uh, we got to a point of log management and that person turns to me and says, Ilya, I still, I still have to call IT for my logs, right? So our conversation pretty much was over by then, okay? Because if that's the case, if in 2020, we still have one department versus another uh, who manages logs and, uh, you know, you have to make a physical call and ask them to provide those logs to you or send an email, um, good luck with asset protection. So, um, this exclusivity of language, the um, unmanageable complexity, uh, the gap between where tech is headed versus where we are with um, our capability uh, for policy and policy and standards, um, the inconsistencies with risk management, and um, that's creating, all of those things are creating this um, misunderstanding, this misunderstanding between the protectors and protectees, okay? We are all aspiring to teach users to do better, whereas they're aspiring to just get their work done. And they will react to something that's fairly easy 
to um, to let's say understand but as I said before the trouble that we're facing the risks that we're facing are fairly complex so where do we need to go right how to do better well we have to focus on humans but not the user the user is dealing with the end result of our own overconfidence. The user is being thrown a bunch of different things in, in the form of training, in the form of uh, different technologies. Let's say that some of them are protection technologies. Um, but who creates all that stuff, right? Um, there's not a single training platform today for corporations that, is, that has been proven to be effective, proven, okay? There's no data, there's no statistics, we don't monitor anything, right? So we deliver that training. What are the metrics after that? How do we monitor compliance, right? Is that happening, right? Is that happening consistently? I dare say not, okay? And a lot of people are referring to these big organizations, Microsoft, Google, whatever, who have these infinitely larger resources to do stuff. That's wonderful. That's great. But how many of those organizations are there? And how many third-party providers do they have? Remember the target breach. So the threat actor is not going to necessarily go and focus on Google. They're going to go and focus on the mom and pop that provide services to them as a sub. Right? And they're going to uh, look at how they can infiltrate Google through their systems. Right? And if it's not Google, it's going to be somebody else. And the mom and pop is, no, is, is none the wiser because they don't have those resources to be able to align with uh, infinitely uh, more complex um, risk landscape, uh, the, 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 the threat landscape, right? So we need to really go back and focus on people who make things in our space, who create software platforms, who do coding, who uh, then sell product to organizations. We really need to focus on uh, the competence and credibility among practitioners in asset protection. Let's call them the cyber, the cyber side, right? The cyber camp, right? And we really need to start understanding that not only do we need to add our own technology to oversee what's going on in organizations. We also need to scrutinize every single platform that the organization already has and that they're running, including uh, word processing, including all the sor sorts of uh, digital tools that the organization has, right? And understand um, how those tools are being used and understand what vulnerabilities those tools um, create and uh, how to mitigate those vulnerabilities and also how to incentivize the organization to not buy vulnerable software that is out of the box vulnerable and maybe talk to the manufacturers of that software and start sharing that in, you know, uh, in greater detail uh, with them to say that your software unfortunately doesn't stand up to the test of um, asset protection. We can't uh, allow for that software to be deployed on our systems because it's, uh, it causes uh, a ton of vulnerabilities. Uh, and then the next question will be with digital transformation, whom are we delegating the responsibility for security to? Do we carefully scrutinize those that will run the cloud? Really? Okay, I recently sent a list to a practitioner in the industry who was talking about uh, how cloud could be actually a more enhanced protection platform for, uh, for organizations. Largely, I'm not in disagreement, but we are making too many assumptions about it. One um, is the competence of individuals who are scrutinizing the cloud, let's say in-house, um, to understand what vulnerabilities may exist in the configuration levels, uh, in, in the types of software that is being run, and so on. Uh, the type of people on the cloud provider side who are looking after um, security, and what is the scope of security, like the gentleman said, um, what is the scope and how do you DB that up between the in-house team and also the cloud providers team? Who's, who's, who bears responsibility for what? We also uh, need to start looking at design. Design at least, at least, in terms of the software that we acquire. 
to run protection operations. I've looked at CM systems and pretty much all of them are terrible from the user perspective. If a user sits in front of a monitor in front of a user interface and they see information coming through CM, they're lost. There's no if, ands, or buts. That's the, way, that's the way it is. And if they believe they're not lost, right, they're missing a ton of additional information that could be, let's say, brought to the actual user interface. But that information is not configured well to arrive um, uh, and, and uh, for the user to properly see it. Um, and so we are acquiring platforms and software, that unfortunately, that's not user friendly. Okay, and therefore, I mean, as I said to you, complexity is huge just from the internet as a tool and from the data that's being created and pushed out, uh, pushed out there. And more and more organizations that are doing this digital transformation that are becoming more digital, right? And yet, we as protectors don't have systems that are well designed to be able to have, for example, asset visibility. Right? Go look for organizations that have complete asset visibility. Let them define the assets, let them prioritize the assets, and then let them demonstrate to you how they have asset visibility. Because the first thing you'll see is that the CISO says, my assets live in digital space. Really? Your assets are doors, your assets are people, your assets are far outside of your servers and computing systems. Okay, and CISOs, unfortunately, don't want to necessarily understand it for, uh, for the large part. So that's where we are. Uh, psychology design are not being looked at, and they should. Um, we also, as I said before, are not looking at risk management. Risk management is really um, kind of lost on people um, in terms of uh, what I said in my previous episodes, how we're not connecting um, our threats and vulnerabilities um, with the overall risk or we are not understanding risks that are arising from threats and vulnerabilities. And we're also not communicating those um, um, to, to senior management uh, with a clear message, clear and, and simple message that goes back to criticality of assets, mission critical assets, right? Uh, we are only now learning how to quantify uh, risk, how to... Um, do, let's say, something like Monte Carlo simulation uh, or other statistical analysis on probability, right? Uh, relative to my assets and the possible scenarios for, um, for damage or loss, right? So we're not looking at dollars and cents uh, as a simple message to the senior leadership who are decision makers about that. Um, we're not doing that, right? Uh, or if we're doing it, good luck looking for and finding, for, uh, finding organizations. Uh, that have adopted that, 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 that approach, right? Um, I mean, if you look at the FAIR model, this is what a, a lot of stuff that they're uh, promoting. But unfortunately, how many organizations have adopted it? Okay, uh, primarily it's the U.S. market, primarily. Uh, am I seeing that uh, like the, the, the FAIR model has been adopted at scale? Not really. Okay, maybe some U.S. companies. So anyway, um, this is what we're not uh, paying attention to. And so, bottom line is, same deal as with uh, what's called fiscal security, right? We're not, uh, we're not a profession, we're a trade. And unfortunately, um, what, what I find um, scary, really, is do we, have, do we have an understanding of what scale we've built with internet and data? Do we really completely, fully understand it? If um, we see Again, if we go back to, to one example of what the Center for Humane Technology now shares uh, and how um, various incidents with abuse of computing systems and, and data um, have evolved and how they're scaling up, have we really been catching up with um, looking at organizations' assets from that perspective? Do we clearly understand what, how much data, how much information, uh, digital information uh, organizations are creating and how we're able to classify it, okay, and how we're able to protect it uh, well beyond computing systems? So my suggestion is, bottom line, we can't have camps. 
we have to um, go past uh, calling cyber cyber. We have to go past calling physical physical because there is nothing of that sort. We're actually living already. We've been talking about the word convergence. We've been living in a converged um, environment for some time. Okay, the first security system I designed when I came to uh, Kroll many years ago was IP uh, IP centric, completely IP uh, IP based. It, even my engineer. Um, my colleague who taught me a lot turned to me and says, Ilya, don't refer to it as CCTV. And that was in 2006. Right? So, um, to be honest with you, um, if uh, organizations today can add a video surveillance camera, which is IP addressable and also um, one that can be found on Shodan and then uh, unfortunately has credentials that are um, that have not been changed uh, and have been set by, by the manufacturer and they're uh, basically can be easily compromised right and that camera is connected to a network to the organization's network without any further thought about protection you're done this is how threat actors can can get in right if in 2020 we still have this simple trivial issue then are we ready to deal with the scale of the problem and we have to look no further than human beings our psychology and design to find solutions i leave you with these thoughts i welcome your comments please stay well